These are seen as the, um, the strongest cabinets, um, and it's a way of the, the system. Um, it filters the best players um, into, the, into the Category 1 clubs. Um, whether that system works or not um, is still to be seen, because um, it's, it's only been around for a number of years um, at the moment. But uh, you do get a, some clubs that are seeing high productivity achievement. So, for example, um, Southampton, um, I've had a, a number of young players come through. Uh, but um, so my main main duty is really making sure that the, the staffing levels are correct. Um, we meet that criteria. Um, the coaching program um, fits the philosophy of the club, um, and uh, making sure that we don't just tick boxes. We do actually get players through to, to the first team. Um, as part of that criteria, we have a, a technical board, um, which I sit on with uh, the first team manager Claudio Ranieri, um, our director of football John Rukin. Um, our chief exec and our director of football operations. Uh, it's very much a, a sort of planning process really about how we're going to get players into the first team. Um, the model looks completely different for each individual player. Um, but it's, it's probably the hardest part of the role um, is what is that pathway going to look like for a player, um, particularly when uh, the club's doing very well and uh, they perhaps don't want to take as, as, as many risks as... Uh, as you would like, and, and, and get large numbers into the first team. Um, but it's also the the, uh, the best part of the role, seeing a young player um, break into um, that upper level um, and make their make their debut in the first team and really start to start to establish themselves. Um, that's the probably the, the, the biggest reward. Um, but uh, also you get that um, throughout the phases as well. Um, when you see young players progress and um, they, they move up the level or move into a new age group, um, you know that that is uh, wholly wholly fulfilling. Um, you know whether it be moving in the professional phase into the first team or just going through from um, the foundation phase and then have made it into our, our youth development model, um, which is which is now becoming full time, and that also has has huge rewards. Um, but also on top of that, I think um, because I'm in the academy manager's position. Um, it's also seeing staff progress as well, not just about the about the players. Um, I do like to see uh, the coaches, sports scientists. Um, sometimes that might be the moving on to a, um, a a different club or a higher role within within the club, not not just in the academy. But uh, that in itself has, um, has has great rewards for us as well, um, because obviously if staff are progressing and doing well at the club, it means that the players are doing well, um, and also it attracts. Um, better coaches to our club because they can see a pathway not only for themselves but obviously a uh, development pathway for players. Great, thank you very much. Peter. Uh, okay, uh, now my great enjoyment is that when I can help people, uh, coaches or players to become better uh, in their performance as a football player or as, in, uh, as, in, uh, as a coach. So that's the challenge for me, that's also the challenge for my staff. And it's enjoyable when you see that people become better uh, on all levels. So I've been coaching uh, soccer for 33 years. So when I was 15 years, I started on grassroots level. I'm an instructor now for 20 years. So I also started on grassroots level. And even nowadays, uh, sometimes one week I'm coaching U15, the best of the Netherlands. And in the same week, I'm coaching uh, the team of my boy, who's playing in uh, uh, U11. On a totally different level, but I enjoy it very much. Uh, because on all levels you see improvement and you see enjoyment. And I think enjoyment is the key for improvement. Um, the challenges are, I think there are maybe three key challenges. The, the first thing I experience is that you have to know yourself. You have to know the way you are thinking, the way you are doing, and what it has for influence on people. The second is that you uh, know your key players, you know your players. Uh, that's a challenge, because uh, like Jan already mentioned, uh, be like me principle is what happens mostly with coaches. And the third is uh, know the situation. Uh, so what we see, especially when we are coaching uh, U15 national team players, that they have a totally different background and they are working in an environment with a lot of expectations for these players. And also a lot of interest and agents and all like all kinds of st uh, stuff. But what has influence on the improvement process? 
So to make that, that's the biggest challenge. That know the situation, deal with the situation, help players to improve. Uh, and sometimes you have to be uh, hard for them to make the next step in learning. Thank you very much. Ben. Thank you. Good morning. Um, work principally with Premier League Academy programs, Football League Academy programs, working with their youth coaching staff to support their development, most of which occurs in their club. And that's probably the greatest enjoyment and the biggest challenge we've put together. The greatest enjoyment is for this year coach working on their education development in their workplace with their players and recognising that their development is something that they can drive themselves. That's also the biggest challenge, which is that cultural change around education being something that's imposed upon people to something that they can drive themselves. Historically, our coach education has very much been turned up. Do what the FA says to do, and you'll get your badge at the end, and then we go back to doing what they fundamentally thought was important. Cultural change around that is asking coaches to identify what they are their fundamentally important, and then they're training and development to be a reflection of that. Which means the training for the coach A will be different from the training for the training for coach B. The motivating part when you see coaches collect that and recognise that the individual development is the course, it's one and the same thing, as opposed to the course being something that we've been on top of that. Yeah. Um, morning. Um, it's nice to be part of the worst boy bands in the world. So, <laughs> uh, so this is from our latest album. <laughs> uh, um, so yeah, I, I, I sit in a, a talent identification department at the, at the Football Association. Well, I guess we've kind of got two main roles really. Uh, one is we've got a team of scouts nationally that identify players that form the squads that the England head coaches under 15 through to seniors with Roy Hodgson and Mark Sampson on the men's and women's side will pick their players from and it's kind of developing and educating that group of scouts to understand what talent might look like and kind of managing the performance versus potential debate as well and the second part of, of kind of like it's my role principally and what our department does is then educate professional clubs, so Premier League clubs, Premier League clubs, their coaches and scouting staff on what to look for in players and the kind of things that it might be or it might not be. Um, coaching pathway has been there for decades, you know, coaching courses have been there, evolved and progressed, but there's been nothing from a, a scouting and recruitment side of things ever. So this is now uh, a, a, a massive education pathway for us that we're trying to embed from the, you know, the local part-time grassroots coach that might have a talented player in their team all the way through to heads of recruitment and technical directors of professional clubs. So that's the kind of the, the major part and, and I lead along a lot of the kind of the, the research and education part of, of that. So it's, it's looking beyond football, um, it's seeing what other sports do, it's seeing what other businesses do, it's seeing what anybody involved in developing high performance might look like. So it's not getting kind of caught up in, in that world of football. Um, I guess the kind of the enjoyment part for me is I don't really have a proper job, you know. I've not got a day's hard work in my life. These hands are perfect, you know. But, but on a Sunday afternoon, you know, I sit in the pub with my mates and watch a game of soccer, and then I'll be winching back and work the next day. I never get that, you know. I'm really fortunate, and you know, our national football centre is a three-hour drive for me, and I'm up there probably once or twice a week. And I can have a really bad drive and it takes me five hours to get there because of a crash on the motorway or whatever. But you get into those gates and you drive down that pathway and you think, yeah, this is alright, it's not bad, I can cope with this. So I, I, I guess I'm really fortunate about that. Um, the enjoyable part, I kind of you know, echo, echo the words that these guys have said from a, a coach's perspective and a, uh, a player's perspective, is just seeing them go on and do some stuff, whatever that might look like. So, you know, I've been fortunate that I've probably had about eight or nine kids that I've worked with. Um, over the years that have gone on to play at uh, international level, I would never claim to have made an international player. They've done all the work. All I would say is in that one, two year that I had them, I didn't mess them up. Uh, they're the ones that have done it, but seeing them progress. But equally, seeing kids that I coached 15 years ago that are now coaches themselves, and again, you know, something somewhere has encouraged them to stay on, and, and again, I've not encouraged them to leave the game. Um, and the biggest challenge is just finding the time to do it all and manage my wife's expectations that I probably will work 80 hours a week and, uh, and that's fun and games that that brings as well. So no, it's, uh, it's part of that, I guess. Good stuff. Nick, thanks very much for asking. Gareth? 
let's go to you. Let's get to the, we have some preset questions. People sent questions in uh, at a time, so we're going to pose those to the gentleman here. Gareth, your team's just won the thing. Congratulations. I'm sure you have a lot to do. That's a great job. How do you now parlay this mindset into your academy players? How does that work? And are there some downsides to watch? I'm sure there's trap, as we all know, there's trappings that come with success. Wealth that comes along with it as well. Here's the challenges that coaches bring. How do you deal with the mindset now that you guys are on top? How do you bring that? What do you have to do with your players to shape them and mold them now with this new, I don't say new mindset, but this is an incredible opportunity. But how do you take this and shape your players? Um, okay, this, uh... I think there's been some um, very, very positives that have uh, come out of this season, um, particularly the, the nature in how we, um, how we achieved winning the Premier League. It wasn't a case of um, just bringing in some real top stars. Um, there was very much a, a coming together of, as, a, as a team, even though we really focused in terms of development on the individual, um, how close they are as a, as a team. Um, and also the, the the work ethic that's gone into uh, to winning the Premier League, um, something that we try and instill into all of the players at the at the Leicester City Academy is about um, how hard you have to work to to achieve it. I think it's very easy for young players to see the um, the rewards uh, and the riches that, um, that, that that the players have, um, but a lot of the time we don't get to see. Um, the work ethic um, and you know the amount of time that you have to put in to, to actually achieve something, um, and I think that's been evident with um, Leicester City's first team this year um, about how hard they work, uh, not just for themselves but for um, each and every member of the team. Um, so it's been a great message um, that's been sent back to to our players that you can see week in week out. So it's um, it's been great for us in terms of um, you know one of our our values of the academy. Um, has really been uh, broadcast um, across the, you know, not just the whole of the country, but you know, when we've been to other countries, people talk about the um, the work ethic of the team and how how close they are as a as a team. Um, probably uh, one of the, the downsides to it um, is the we we're, we're very fortunate that we've got um, an academy that's sat with the first team, so we're all on all on one site. And um, obviously, the riches that that go with being Premier League champions means that um, the first team players, obviously Premier League players anyway, have nice car, nice clothes. Um, they come in with a great shower bag. Um, you know, ev everything they have is is the is the, is the, is the top of the tree. And um, our young players want to mirror that. Um, so they they do get sidetracked um, with um, external rewards um, rather than being a uh, an internal motivation, so that is certainly a challenge. Um, we've got players on, you know, uh, huge amounts of money um, in the first team, and uh, the younger players, you know, want to want to mirror that. Um, so it's it's really making sure that we we steer them on the right pathway. We do have a an education program that sits alongside the football program um, that really uh, works on. Making sure we develop the, the whole individual, um, and it's not just about the about the football for them. Um, and then uh, the bit around creating round, well-rounded individuals um, does in, does enhance the, the football side. So we we have uh, workshops in terms of lifestyle, uh, managing finance, uh, but we do get support as well from um, from the Premier League, the FA, uh, the PFA that come in and, uh, and do do uh, huge amounts of work with with the players. In terms of keeping them um, on, on the right track, but uh, you know, I wouldn't want that um, that bit that's difficult to manage to put any downside on what the rewards have been this year. Um, in terms of motivating our young players, it's been it's been fantastic. Um, we have the under 19s uh, Champions League next year to look forward to. So obviously we mirror our first team program. Um, and I spoke to some of the guys earlier. And usually you get to the end of the season and players are. Uh, you know, desperate to go on their break, they, they, they are tired, they do work hard, um, you know, it looks a, a great job from the outside, but they do, you know, they're, they're, it's 100% all the time, we give them what they eat, what they do, in and out of the club, um, but we usually get to the end of the season and they're, they're desperate for that break. Um, this year, um, the players were coming in and sort of saying, right, when do we report back, can we come in during the summer, what facilities can we use, do we have access to this, do we have access, 
So it's you know they're, they're desperate to come back into the club because of the the environment that's um, that's that's been created this year. So it's been you know every week has been has been wonderful. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Peter, when you're scouting, at what age can you when you're looking at your players? We often hear, and this is maybe more so we hear here, late bloomers. How do you, what criteria are you looking at for your younger players versus kind of what you call your older youth players that would be late bloomers? What do the younger players need to show versus what are you looking for in the late bloomer? Call it late bloomers in the system that you can pick up later. Um, yeah, it's a difficult question uh, because uh, talent identification is very difficult. Uh, maybe at the start, uh, maybe the most important thing in talent identification is that you start with just naming what you see in the game. And what does what the player do in, when the team is attacking? What's the player team doing when he's defending? Uh, what is he doing in the transition moments? Uh, and also, then the next step is to analyze it. Why is he doing it that way? And it's always related to the context of the team, the context of the opponent. But m what we see mostly with scouts, they forget the most important step. They say it's a good player, and why is a good player? I can't tell. But you can see what you can tell what you see. So that's the first step. And if you have made the first step, and then you make an analysis. So why is he doing the way that I look? See the qualities instead of the dishes, uh, the, the things he can't do. Uh, don't look in an ideal way, way to to children. So maybe he is a good player when he, when the team is playing the wrong ball. Or maybe he's a good defender because he picks the ball always on the right moment. That is his quality. And when in the tag, maybe he plays a long ball instead of a positional ball, a short pass. Maybe that's his quality. And then you can improve maybe the things he is not good at the moment. So that is, I think, the key. That you start with looking at football and name the things you see. And also see it in the context of the game. The challenge is for us is that we always bring players in a different context with the national team. You play with the best of the country and you play against other teams, other countries with other systems of play. So it is very hard for us to predict who can be the best in the new context. And the, the, the other question is about the potential. You can see what they do at the moment. Uh, but you can't see the potential. I can't see the potential. If I was straight into it, maybe I was not working with the Federation, but I had another job. So it's looking at what they do at the moment, and maybe also look at intentions, whether they have made good intentions, but not always picking out the right way. And then your question about being good at the moment or are late blooming or late mature. What you see sometimes, the, the smaller children. Are, are, are good at decision making because they have to be smart but not, not always successful at that moment so because of the, the context a lot of big boys around him so he, he knows where to run but in the end the big boys are, are stronger and faster so he can't make it into the ball so that's, that's a challenge and especially what you see is that uh, until the U13s uh, there is a balance mostly in the teams, and then in between the U13s and the U16s, you see a big difference. Some stay small, some become very big, and when you become a big, it can be not always an advantage. They have a lack of coordination, they have problems with the ball. Uh, when you get small, you have to improve in decision making. When you are the strongest, you are no, there is no situation that you have to improve in decision making, because you always can solve problems with your Strongest, and then after you seventy, it becomes more even. So in every phase, you see that there are some problems in talent identification, and you always have the discussion about nature and nurture. So when you play with Ajax Amsterdam and you play every day with the best players around you, the best team, and your team is mostly the best in the game. That's the context in which I see these players. But I've also in my national team players who play not with Ajax Amsterdam. They play with a small academy. Not in a good team. Mostly against opponents who have more ball. And what I experience when I pick these players in the national team, they can make the next step and they become better 
a song play right. Fortunately, then one or two years later, they are within a big academy. So that's that's the system. So that's that's the challenge. And uh, every age has its specificity uh, in, in scouting. Um, so that's that's. I think it's good that you have scouts who are very related to the age group because it is all an experience. And I totally agree that, that scouting, we have coach education in the Netherlands, we don't have a lot of education for scouts, and the same for technical directors. Only coaches have to educate, but scouts, they are key. They bring the players to the academies or they bring the players to, to national teams. For a coach in the Netherlands, the Netherlands is very small, Every player we follow in 50, we follow around approximately 100 players. Every player I see at least five times a year play, and most I see more than 10 times play. But that's easy because the distances are very short in the Netherlands. But is then I think it's impossible for the coach of England to see all these players in the same amount of time. But my colleagues can answer that. Thank you. Good, good segue. So Ben. Looking at competition review, something we always look at here, something that factors in, especially for our country, is competition, travel times for the younger groups. Do you see an ideal range for competition dates and travel times and distance? Where do you see that in your competition reviews? And do you see sort of any best best ideas or best practices for those? Yeah, I think the travel thing is just one small part of the larger games program and challenge. Um, probably best to start with what you want. So from my experience at Chelsea, we had a vision for one class, one class, one class, one class, and play internationally. And if I believe that's your vision, you need to look at what the games and programs are going to give you to enable you to meet that vision. So that may, they may get called up to go to Slovakia for an international game and play in front of the class and crowd on a bad pitch. But that's the first time they've done that when they go for an international qualifier and chance to look for four boys to play So it's a really good need to build that into the program. But if you take a ten-year-old, you want to expose them to that kind of possibility very early in their career. Possibly not. So I'm going to what do you do with the games program? We were fortunate in our environment that you had some flexibility in what you did. So we play five a side, we play seven a side, we play nine a side, we play eleven a side. Because of the training ground that you were based that had a collection of different pitches, you had flexibility in terms of the fields that you use on what different pitches might give you on different days. Also had the flexibility to be able to go and play against boys' side if you want to play against boys' side and then give you a different challenge. You could go and play against grassroots teams and challenge the players in slightly different ways, which gave you an opportunity to mix up experiences of the player in terms of the positions that they play, the number of years that they play, the number of different players, the type of systems that they play. Because in our early years, our first team was playing 4 3 3, the international youth team was playing 4 4 2. So if we're going to achieve our vision, the players were exposed to those two systems. So ultimately we need to get flexibility into the games program to enable the class to experience a range of different systems. Leading on to the travel bit, our challenge was that the games program could be quite sterile. The games program was organised by the FA at the time. Um, you would go to Arsenal, Arsenal looked a lot like Chelsea, similar players, similar profile, play similar football. You go to Charlton, similar players, similar profile, similar football. So you might get 20 games in a season, but actually it wasn't really 20 games, it was one game repeated 20 times. So what experience do we actually get as a result of the games program? So that's how do you build in that variability? But at under tens, we would sometimes take the girls from Norwich, sorry, from Chelsea to Norwich and back again, and they might play 40 minutes of football, having spent five or six hours in the car, which at 10 years of age just seemed like nonsense. So how do you build a games program that has them in the car for 10 minutes, but still provides them with an answer of a challenge, but still then consider some of the overseas stuff? And so the, the, the national travel and stuff was on a Saturday afternoon, the first team would get on a coach at 2 o'clock, they would drive to Sunderland, which in Canada terms isn't that far, in English terms is a million miles away, so about five hours on the coach, stay overnight, play the game, come back Sunday night, and because they were amateur, they were still getting up and going to college and going to work on Monday morning. We needed to factor that into the program so the girls got that experience, so under 10 and under 12, we might go to the Isle of Wight, which is a small island, maybe about an hour away from Chelsea, which wouldn't be bad. They might go to Jersey, so they go away from home, they play different sides that they wouldn't normally play against, they spend time away from their family. So you start to expose them to those kind of experiences, but even that out of the depth we go as far away as we did when we got to 14, 16, when we go to things like the Dyna Cup, the Dothier Cup, they go overnight, and they play competition where you've got to play five, six, seven, eight, nine games in four, five days, which brings its own challenges, emotionally brings its challenges, physically brings its challenges. So I'm going to start with what you want. If you want players that can adapt to different systems, play national football and play the first team, that can be a certain type of profile that we want to go into the program period. 
if you're a player just to endure football, endure playing football, spending three hours in the car or a coach, play four minutes football, possibly the best use of the time. Good stuff. Thank you very much. Nick, something we hear often, you kind of see this grassroots level talk about how, how we're tweaking certain players. And you see that sometimes you hear, well, you need to have a nastiness, you need to be the mean kid, you need to be that slightly tweaked off person to really be a successful professional. You have to be kind of out there a little bit. What's the value of the niceness player? What's the, you know, do they have to be like that? Or can the nice guy still finish first? But how do you kind of manage that as you're developing players? Do they have to be that ruthless, cutthroat player? Can you be still a nice guy and still win to have that character? Yeah, it's an interesting one. I'm certainly the kind of roles that a lot of you guys will have working with grassroots kids that are going to never end up anywhere near the white caps or the international team. Um, the a main part of your role is to develop good people. And we're really fortunate that we can use football as that vehicle to do that. Um, the beauty again is, is that you know, everybody sat in here is a different person that has your own kind of unique view of the world that's shaped by all your own experiences. Uh, but we have to allow our kind of young players to develop their own view of the world as well. We can't just impose our own values and beliefs onto a kid because they're very, very different to us. Um, so it's how we then use our coaching sessions to develop some of these skills. But this still goes on at a high performance end as well. So a good example of a different sport was with the England under 18 rugby team. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with rugby. It's like it's the proper sport without the armour that you guys wear. Um, uh, the yeah. uh, so <laughs> that's my friends. Um, yeah. Uh, so so the England under 18 rugby team were in a hotel in Leeds, six miles outside the city centre, and they split all the players, international players, into groups of four, and and they said, right, here's a £10 note and a riddle. We'll see you later. And the coaches just left them to it. The only thing that they had to do was buy the coaches a present with the money. So they then had to solve the riddle, work out where to get to to, to effectively solve the issue. It was a coffee shop in Leeds City Centre, which was about six miles away. So they didn't have enough money to get everybody in a taxi to the, to, the, uh, to the meeting point. There wasn't a bus route, so they couldn't get on the bus and do that. So these players had to work out how to solve the problem. Uh, some of them managed to convince the hotel staff to put them in a car and take them to the uh, into Leeds. Some of them said, well, it's only six miles, let's run. Like, imagine that the 18 stone prop was delighted by that running down the A6 for six miles. Um, some of them got to Leeds city centre, but then couldn't work out the riddle, so went around every coffee shop in Leeds for three hours. So there's some resilience that they're developing by just kind of keeping going with it. So it's how we can set up environments that are going to develop skills in character in people. But for me, it's not necessarily about the character, it's about the behaviours that we then use and we put into those kind of situations. Because Everybody will see certain things differently in a different way. And Ben's character will mean that he will deal with certain situations in a different way than I will. But equally, Ben will then deal with it, might have to be a similar situation a week later, but he might deal with it in a different way because he's a different person now. Because a week's gone on and he's thought about things in a different way. So it's, it's really about how we can use our football sessions to develop character in people. At the high performance end, the whole kind of you know nice guys don't win Again, I don't necessarily buy that. You need a certain kind of streak about you that is independent and uh, you have to be focused um, and almost selfish at times, I think, if you are going to be an elite athlete because you have to put the work in. It's not easy. But equally, you look at some of the things that Gareth mentioned earlier on with the, the teamwork and the ethos of a good group of guys coming together to be successful. That's part of that but they've also probably got some characters within that team that keeps people in check. Um, you can't just have a team at a high performance zone purely based on good characters, because otherwise you'll never win a thing. You have to have a mix of different people that come together in terms of the type of person, the skill set that you bring, and everything else that goes with it, because 11 Lionel Messi's wouldn't win a thing either. 
It's that blend, and that's the beauty of what we've got in this game. It's the blend of different people that come together, whether you're five foot seven or six foot three, that make the game work. So I don't think it's just about being nice. I think it's a whole kind of raft of stuff that needs to come together. Nick, thank you. We're going to open up to your questions now, just before we move on to the next session. So we have our uh, man and wife over here help us out and uh, get some questions up. So anybody, questions? We've got a couple minutes to nail everybody with any questions. Hands up, who wants to ask something? Sir. And you can ask any gentleman here. Pose it anyone you want, or the group. Sure. Um, just earlier, Peter, you mentioned uh, something that was <coughs> talking about we were hearing about encouraging kids and, and that type of thing, which, which you're all talking about. But you did mention at one point, sometimes you have to be hard for them to make the next step. And that's just what you were sort of examples you might have for that. Uh, I can. Uh, I give an example. Uh, 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 recently, uh, we had an international match with uh, our U15s, and what we see, we have a very talented player who is also a player who is uh, a lot of in English clubs want to have, have him. Uh, he has an agent. Uh, his parents think that he is king. Uh, his agents are thinking that he is a king, and he isn't performing at his maximum level. So he is good enough for the team, but he is not in his maximum performance. So uh, we had an international match against Serbia, and there happened some things in professional behavior. Not seriously, but seriously enough to have a talk with him. And then I made the choice, because of to help, I want to help him to become more focused on, on becoming a professional football player. So I didn't pick him to the squad for Germany. So I did it in combination with the club, because I always start with the club when I do that some st stuff. The club totally agrees, they understand we have to help this boy to make the next step, because the environment thinks he's a king. Uh, the money players can get at that age is are huge compared to the money their parents uh, earn at the moment. So that are decisions we have to make as a coach to help these players. And I've talked to the club and also talked to the player because I have to explain it. And in the end, maybe I've also did this uh, once or two years before, then when the players are one or two years older, and then I talk to them, then some of them say, yeah, I, it was good. It was good that you helped me to see what was necessary to make the next uh, stage. And uh, I think that's also a role of a coach. So sometimes you have to support them, and sometimes you have to be hard to help them, not because of yourself, because normally I want to play with the best players. And I know when I leave out good players, I don't play with the strongest team, and Germany is a strong opponent. Not me. Thank you. Other questions? <laughs> Sir. I'm just wondering um, how many of you have programs for female participants in the in the sport. Like obviously for the males, there's the there's the upper end of soccer and places to go and see why they go to the academy and dreams there. For in Canada on the female side, we're starting to see the success with the national team. And that's the, the role. But do any of you have programs and whatnot that carry through for females? Yeah, certainly from uh, Tan Ali side on, on the national teams, yeah, the, the girls' program mirrors the boys' program. Um, they have a structure of, of a scouting network, there's pathways exactly the same from 15s through to seniors. Um, it, it wouldn't be any different for, for the boys' side for us. Um, it's, it's either men's football or women's football, you know, you could just say it's probably football. To the, the, big clubs, the big clubs also um, yeah, we've um, our um, ladies' program has just achieved the equivalent to um, Cat One as a, as a as a girls' centre. Um, so we um, they're they're really just in the process of establishing themselves at the moment, um, but we do work closely with them. Um, we've got um, shared resources in terms of um, staffing. Um, we we try and support them as much as possible. Um, we're currently looking at options in terms of a new training facility where. Um, there is a possibility of both being housed there. Um, at the moment, the training ground is for the for the male um, side of the game, um, but uh, we're certainly wholly involved in the in the female game, and uh, we'll support that as much as possible. 
Um, I have been to um, a top Premier League club and seen a female player playing um, in their academy programme. And uh, I did ask the coaches the, the question about uh, um, about why she was why she was playing because the, obviously there's going to be a cut-off point where she would have to go into the, to the female game. And their answer to me was she poses a different problem for our male players. Um, she was the best player in the group, and they felt it was appropriate for her to be training at that at that level at that time. Um, we do have a, a pre-season program this year where um, our under 15 team is playing against um, Arsenal ladies. Um, so uh, we think that'll be hugely beneficial for for the boys. And uh, last season, uh, before I came to, to Leicester, I was at Bristol City, and um, the the women's team was probably a higher profile than the the men's first team. Uh, they played in the Champions League. They beat Barcelona. Um, they they had uh, huge success in the in the league the season before. Uh, the manager went on to become the the, the women's national team manager. Um, but we trained on similar evenings, um, and we did. You know, we used to play uh, programs where we would we would play against the girls. The only the only mismatch was the uh, was the physicality of the the older boys um, in the youth development phase. But certainly within the foundation phase, um, we could we could match them up easily. Great. Ben, do you want to hear? Yeah, the, the game in England, females, has grown exponentially over the last twenty years. Um, Fascinating in the English FA and women's football until the 70s. Um, the Centre of Excellence programme, so this development programme in professional club started in 1998. I was a coach at United at that point when we started the programme, we did it on £5,000. I think one of the benefits of doing it with very little at the time was we got highly motivated people trying to do stuff to think something that wasn't financially driven. And as the money's increased, it started to bring some of the same challenges that the men's game was faced and continues to face. And that kind of perception that if you're a high performing men's Premier League club, you should have a women's club attached to you, and just by virtue of that, you're going to have a high performing uh, women's club as well. Uh, I guess the resources becomes an issue. And take the boys' game, the game, the girls' game, the girls' game is the same challenge. You really need to be in the Premier League to have a well financed academy. But as Gareth has alluded to, getting to the Premier League is hard to get players in the first and the first class. The women's game is no different. You need the money to be able to run the program, but a well supported finance, 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 and the best support you to do that doesn't necessarily mean that the infrastructure is in place. And the time of Chelsea was a great example of that. Uh, Ramblers had just come into the club, just throwing loads of money at loads of stuff. And my manager used to liken it to a swan that looks really graceful on the top and the middle of the legs, and away just to try and keep up. The infrastructure wasn't in place, but the club had an expectation because of the expectations of the brand that the women's team was going to leave, but they had no success with the women's team historically. So they can sometimes be some challenges that do want to touch the women's game and see if they uh, like that, that recognise some of the other things that need to be there to get them in the first place, particularly the new developments. We have time for one more question just before we have the next session going on. So you have your hand up first. Go ahead. In the, in the, the Seattle Sounders jersey? Yeah. Well, I'm going to say, I'm going to get a house jersey right here. I'm going to say, oh man, who's that? Fine. So Nick, you uh, mentioned a, a little bit about this last night, but I was interested in, uh, in the states we seem to find that uh, the burnout age is typically around 14, 15, typically entering into high school. Uh, do you have any points as to how to avoid that without sacrificing development or maybe even the signs that a player is getting to that stage? Uh, yeah, it's an interesting one. And I've had some conversations with some guys here about it. We, our issue in England is typically we start to have a drop out about 14. Um, the guy I was chatting yesterday said that yours is similar, 12, 13, you start to find kids will, will, will drift away from the game. Um, so we've gone through a big process now of, of asking the kids why and what they want from their football experience. And, and the guy that I was speaking to said, oh, that's a good idea. Um, uh, because, you know, it's been a long time since I was 12, so why should I decide what a 12-year-old's game looks like today? And what they were come back, coming back and saying was, they love being with their mates, they're there to have fun, they like competition, but they don't like the adult emphasis on winning. So just get your head around that. Kids like the competition, but they don't like our emphasis on winning. 
And what they do then was part of it was uh, that was linked to the dropout bit. Um, the physical issue was was a minor part for the kids from some of our feedback that, that they were saying was, and again it comes back to our expectations of the kids at that stage. We know that if they're going through some of those signs where um, you know previously they were all very coordinated and could do stuff technically and tactically and physically, and all of a sudden they look like Bambi on ice. Um, there's a reason why, and it's just about us as, as coaches really understanding that. I know a kid that. Um, who had a, a growth spurt physically at a professional club, had his growth spurt, and he'd grown two inches in three weeks. Right? Two inches in three weeks. Um, and the knock on effect technically was he couldn't do anything that he used to be able to do now, because all of a sudden his feet weren't the same size, his legs were all over the shop. Um, psychologically, he then, his confidence and self esteem just plummeted. Socially, his mates were then going, well, I'm not giving him the ball because he's now useless. Um, and the coach said, well, he now can't do it, so let's get rid of him. And the kid got released from the system because we hadn't recognised that it was a physical thing that was part of the reason that affected everything else around this kid. So I think we've got a role as, as coaches, whether they're in high performance or grassroots, it doesn't matter. These are 13, 14, 15 year old kids that are going to go through the same rite of passage that we've all done. And it's just about us understanding when to dial off and take some load off the kids, when to say, you know, that you've got a sore knee, you might have a little bit of uh, Osgood slatters and understand some of the issues that they might. Don't come training, have some rest, and then help the kids plot their way through it. So by the time they get to 17, 18, 19, whenever it is that they kind of come out of the other side of it, then we can start up with the load and, and developing them as players. But it's about recognising some of the signs and symptoms of, of overuse injuries. Uh, and educating yourself to, to understand some of that as well. Nick, thank you. Everyone, because we don't want to have you late for your next session, I'm just going to finish off with one last thing. Gentlemen, just uh, a minute each here. You've obviously come up to the system. You're all extremely well experienced. You've probably been mentored by someone at one point. Who Can you pass us on something a mentor of yours has given you that you can pass on to everyone here that they can take back to their clubs and the people that they work with? What's something a top mentor that you've grown up with has passed on to you that you can pass on to us? Go ahead, start us to go down. Okay, well, um, I'm probably um, preaching to the converted, um, but it's very much about um, don't don't think you know everything. Um, continue with that uh, uh, that lifelong learning program. Um, do attend CPD um, as, as much as you can. Um, but um, uh, it's a strange thing to say at a, at a football conference, but don't think it's all about football. Uh, go and look at other sports. Um, other industries um, about what you can um, take take from there um, and, and implement it to, to youth development. Um, you're obviously all very um, passionate about developing young players, um, as you wouldn't be here. Um, so um, go out and find uh, better ways uh, of developing young players um, and, and share it with others um, because we're, we're all in it um, for, the, for the same thing. We want to um, you know, we, we want young players to, to progress in the game. Um, we want to raise the profile of the game. Um, so that's what um, you know. Uh, people that I've I've worked with or look up to as mentors always sort of said to me to make sure I continue on that that path of CPD, um, but don't just think it's all about it's all about the football. Thank you, Peter. Um, yeah, it's a combination of uh, mentoring. Uh, when you are a long time coach, you always have some coach you think, yeah, that I want to copy or that I want to use. Uh, and that way, I never want to use it. But maybe the two key things are except that if you're coaching football, it's unpredictable. This is about the decision making of your players. And if you are a coach who was very structured and very, how do you call it, uh, perfectionistic, then it's hard for you as a coach to accept that it's unpredictable. You can't predict everything in the game. So that was for me a big learning point. So that is a player sport, and you have to accept unpredictability. And it's all about decision making by players. So sometimes a step back. And the second thing is, uh, some coaches are more focusing on the content, that what you are telling. Uh, some coaches are more focused on the relation, how you tell it. And it's always about the balance. So I was a coach when I started, was maybe good at the content.
but not always good at the relation. So then you see that you don't achieve your goal. So the content is right, but the way you are doing it is not the right way for that player. So every player is also different. So that's your experience, where you're a long time coach and you always reflect on what you are doing. Then you, you know what will work and maybe what won't work. Thank you, Ben. Probably two things from mine. The first one was about uh, being uncomfortable. You can never be lazy in conversation with this person. Always probe you, always make you think about why you're talking, saying the things that you say, and why you're thinking in the way that you're thinking, which is often discomforting. You may feel as if you've got to come up with an answer for that, but consequently you make you think a lot. And when you're involved in the next conversation with that person, you knew that you didn't come from a particular perspective, which made you think. The second thing that you was great at was about ownership and responsibility. You always attach your own to you, and you knew how far I let you go on a certain day. Sometimes you let you go to the opposite side of the room. But when you start to struggle, it will be enough to pull you back in. Other times, it keep you quite tight. And whether we're developing coaches or whether we're developing players, everything that we do gives opportunity to be or we take it away. We don't do anything else. If we pick someone that's up, we start them from that particular game into a particular team, we give an opportunity to some and we're taking it away from others. We just need to understand why we're giving an opportunity and why or taking it away, you can rationalise while you're doing that. That's no problem. <coughs> Um, I guess probably lots of informal mentors, and, and similar to you guys, you know, just take the opportunity to uh, learn from the people around as much as you can. You know, I'm fortunate that I've probably seen Ben work quite often, but I deliberately made the effort to come out and watch him work yesterday because he's an expert at what he does. Um, the, the kind of the two things really for me, from my keenest mentor, I guess, um, is one, it's, a, it's about them and not you. It, it's about empowering them allowing them opportunities to make decisions um, and have ownership of it and, and I guess the last thing really is just be nice to kids <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> gentlemen thank you everyone for being part today have a big hand here <laughs> So...